Thanks be to God.
I'd like to again call to your attention the important voters meeting next Sunday right after our service. That meeting is to call a new pastor to St. Peter's. It's very important that all of you who possibly can attend, attend. It's very important not only in the congregation's history but also in your history to have a pastor serve you. And God has chosen to work through the voters' assembly, the congregation that comes together to elect a pastor. God has chosen that way for this congregation so that you might have a pastor. Now, God knows who's coming here. We don't. So we put our trust and faith in God to provide the person he has chosen to come here and serve you with the gospel. And now to the sermon. Our text for this morning is from Matthew 20, 15 to 16. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, how can you be so unfair at times? Help us through the Holy Spirit's enlightenment to understand in Jesus' name, amen. There was a uh, golf tournament, a pro-am, that was held. And one of the features in the tournament was the hole-in-one contest. All golfers who had registered were invited to take one shot to make a hole-in-one, and the prize was a million dollars. So you can be sure that everybody signed up. Now, the best shot of the day so far had been a professional golfer who had won a number of uh, national uh, tournaments. In his own life, he had scored 20 hole-in-ones. That's a phenomenal number. And uh, he got up to the tee box. He hit the golf ball, and it came within a whisker of being a hole in one, just six inches away. Then a, another golfer came up. He was an amateur, and uh, nobody really knew who he was. Uh, he got up there. He took a practice swing, and you could almost hear this gasp through the the. Uh, the uh, uh, the crowd because his swing was just not a classic swing. It, it, it was ugly. But he got up there, he teed up his ball, he hit the ball, and his swing was just as bad as his practice swing. And the ball took off and it started to slice. For those who don't play golf, slice means that instead of going straight, it kind of veers off to the right. And you, everybody could hear the ball hitting a tree. And they were all kind of shaking their head. But all of a sudden the ball came out of the, the trees almost miraculously. It almost looked like it picked up a little speed. And it went toward the green. And it hit just in front of the green. And then began to roll toward the pin. And it hit the ball that the professional had just hit, and it was only six inches away from the hole, it hit the ball and went into the hole. A hole in one in the most peculiar manner. Now, of course, you didn't have to be a mind reader to know what was going through the crowd's mind. There was one group who said, boy, talk about luck. And the other group, especially the golfers, the other golfers, they were thinking, boy, is that unfair. Yeah, life can be pretty unfair. The servants in our gospel lesson this morning, that's what they were thinking. Unfair. It's unfair that men only work one hour 
would get paid the same as one who has worked 12 hours in the vineyard. And of course, Jesus knew life is unfair and told this parable to help us understand how life can be unfair for a reason. Even today, 2,000 years from the time Jesus gave this parable, if you go into Napa Valley, Sonoma Valley in California, you will see day workers being hired. The vineyards are bustling with great activity because it's the harvest time, and when the owner decides the sugar in the grape is at its optimum best, it is now the time to harvest, not next week, now. And all hands have to be on deck. So they hire extra workers, day workers. And they do that even now. The owner of the vineyard in the parable did just the same. He went into the marketplace in the early morning, probably just before 6 a.m., and he hired everybody that was there and told them, you will get paid a denarius. Now, a denarius is not something we commonly run into, but I can describe it to you. It's a coin about the size of our dime, and it was made of silver, like our coinage used to be. And it's about twice the thickness of a dime. Today, the silver in that would be somewhere around $2. Now, it used to be, maybe you remember your grandparents talking about how they used to work all day for a dollar. Okay, that was kind of a common wage. Uh, and a denarius was a common wage you paid for somebody working for a day. It was a fair offer. Everybody gets on board. They go into the vineyard and start working. But the owner of the vineyard knows he needs more workers, so he goes out at 9 a.m. and hires everybody that is there and says, I'll, I'll make it right for you. Still needs more workers, so he goes out at noon and 3 o'clock and he hires everybody that's there. And even at 5 p.m., one hour left in the day, he goes back into the marketplace and asks, how come you're still here? How come you're just waiting? And they said, well, we haven't been hired. I'm sure people in Jesus' audience probably find, yeah, yeah, we know why they didn't get hired. They were probably drinking last night and only got up about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Lazy bums. But he hires them. 6 o'clock rolls around. Sun is setting. Time to pay up. The owner tells the foreman, okay, call the ones who have worked only an hour and pay them. Down to the first workers that were hired. So these fellows who had been working only one hour, fresh as a daisy, they come up and to their surprise, I'm sure they were paid the denarius, the same amount of a day's wage. The ones who had worked 12 hours, you could see their minds ticking away. Wow, if they get paid that much for one hour, what are we going to get? And as everybody goes up, everybody, including them, the 12-hour men, the men with tiredness and sore muscles, they get paid a denarius. And wouldn't we grumble too? Hey, that doesn't seem fair. But the owner says, do you begrudge my generosity? We all look at life pretty much that way. We were hardly out of our diapers. And we had just learned the word no and mine when we realized what fair meant. Fair meant I got my just cut. Fair meant 
that even as a three-year-old, I could argue like a lawyer to my parents as to what was fair. I remember when I was young, my dad told my brother and I to take a seat at the kitchen table. He had gotten some nice ice cream. We're going to have dessert. He scoops up two bowls and he puts them in front of us. My brother and I each looked at our bowl, and then we each looked at each other's bowl, and then my brother says, hey, you gave Eric more than I got. This went on all the time. He was six years younger than me. So my dad apparently had had it up to here with his complaint, and he says, oh yeah? And he picks up both our bowls, puts it on the counter, reaches into a cabinet, pulls out a scale. He puts one bowl on the scale, my bowl. And he says, now, see exactly where that needle is. My brother's looking at it, okay. Then he puts my brother's bowl on the scale. And without looking, my dad says, see, look where that needle's at. He looks at it, and it is a hair's difference, short. And my brother says, see, I told you, you gave Eric more than me. My dad just threw up his hands and, you know, rolled his eyes and just sighed and couldn't figure out what else to do. Yes, we look at things that way, too. I've worked here for 10 years. And this young fellow comes along and gets a job and he gets promoted right away. It's not fair. That's how we feel. It's not fair. People cut in line. It's not fair. And when we hear this parable, if you have any business sense at all, you've got to say, well, that's very nice, but boy, I can't run a business like that. My workers usually would get as much money working one hour as the others who have to work a lot more. Boy, that would be just confusion. It's bad business. But as you heard in the Old Testament, Isaiah said, God, tells us, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And when we think about ourselves, even though we've learned to say what is fair or not fair, we still suffer those injustices. And that's because this is how we often think. One, I'm a good person. I deserve things because I am good. Two, when I don't get my fair share, that's wrong. And I have to say something about that, or at least think it. Three, it's wrong, and I don't like it. Four, I want justice. Who's going to make this right? This has got to be corrected. We can't be going unfair all the time. But as a child of God, we shouldn't be thinking that way. As a child of God, we start out by saying, I'm a sinner. When I stand before God, that Bible verse from Romans rings true. The wages of sin is death. And as a sinner, even though I get a lot of good things from God's hands, a lot of things I kind of conveniently forget, some things I conveniently get used to and start thinking it's what I deserve, God is indeed not giving me what I deserve because that would be death. Three, I'm wrong in my thinking 
if I deserve things. And for as a child of God, I should trust God and his grace to make things good and right. You see, in our eyes, God sometimes makes mistakes. In our eyes, we think that God is sometimes not very fair. But let's remember, it is from our eyes that we see those things. Not according to God's mercy. And here we are confronted with the fact that God is perfect in his justice. And he's also perfect in his love for us. Perfect in his grace. It's hard for us to really comprehend it because we are so far from that concept. How can God be perfect in his justice? We who are sinners standing before God, demanding our rights, God says, yes, you will get what you deserve. The wages of sin is death. But out of my perfect grace, I'm not going to make you pay for it. I put all the sins of, that you have committed, all the sins that the world has committed, and I put them on the back of my son Jesus. He satisfies the perfect justice that I demand that all sin is punished by death. Jesus takes all that sin on the cross and pays it perfectly. God the Father accepts it, marks our debt paid in full because of his grace, his generosity. And we are forgiven. So we experience God's perfect justice in Jesus. We experience God's perfect grace through the forgiveness in the name of Jesus. What Jesus did on the cross is credited to our account. And we stand in the mercy of God. We stand to receive him and all that he has given to us. So where do you stand? Are you angry with God at times because he seems to be so unfair? There is forgiveness for that. Do you stand before God and marvel in his grace that he would love such a sinner as me? You are standing in God's grace. May you stand that way in Jesus' name. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for uh, confessing our faith. Using the words of the Messiah. I believe in one God, the Father of
our prayer. For this nation and protection from harm, for our civic leaders, that they administer justice and good citizenship, for our cities and communities, and for the common welfare of us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For seasonal weather, for those who are suffering from the western fire, for those who are suffering through the destruction of the hurricane in the south, and for the fruitfulness of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer. For all those in need, for those seeking employment, for the hungry and homeless, for the widowed, for the orphan, and those who must raise their children alone, for those in prison, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the homebound, for the sick and dying, and those who care for them, especially Sue uh, Midlock's co worker, Maddie, and uh, Edwin, Lois. Hear our prayer. We pray for those who celebrate wedding anniversaries, especially Edward and Heather, Jim and Debbie, Joseph and Karen. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our Lord, prayer. To your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
thank you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. 